I'm Robin Bennett for those that have not met me before. And I am one of the co-founders of the Dog Roost. Susan's over there on the other screen. Susan Briggs from, she's in Texas. I'm in Colorado. She's the other co-founder of the Dog Roost. And for those that are new to the Dog Gurus, we help pet care businesses launch, grow, and profit. So we are all about helping pet care industry professionals grow their businesses and most importantly, keep the dogs safe. That's always been our passion. And we also are now launching some information for pet parents. So we're branching out. This year is going to be a big year to do some other new stuff as well. So welcome to all of you who are tuning in. What we're going to talk about today is scheduling and setting up your play groups, not so much scheduling, more about setting up your play groups. How do you decide um, which dogs should be in which play groups? How do you know if the dogs are going to play well together? Do you do it just based on size? So all those kinds of questions we're going to talk about today. If you have questions about this topic, just leave them in the comment section and we will scan the comments from time to time. I do see lots of people joining us in here now. So Beck and Lisa and Marie and Joanne. So welcome everybody. We're glad you're here. How do you want to kick things off, Susan? I think first, let me just say that one of the things that Susan and I recently saw, maybe you guys are on TikTok, saw it also, was this horrendous situation in a daycare and the person who posted basically said, this was my worst day at work. Mm -hmm. and, and it was basically, I don't even know how many dogs I should have counted, but there were at least 30 or 40 dogs in this one group and a fight broke out. And the video, it looks like it is from the video that's in the daycare and it just shows a huge fight. Luckily from reading the comments and the person who posted and all that, the dog was not seriously injured, but what most disturbed yeah. me was a lot of comments on there of people going, yeah, that happens to our daycare all the time. Yeah, that happens a lot. I was horrified by that more than anything else is how many people thought that was okay. There were a lot of comments from people saying you shouldn't have that happen, which was good. But I felt like there were a lot more comments of people saying dogs will be dogs. And that is not the case. So I'm just going to start out by saying if you're running your play groups well and you have good staff training and good dog evaluations, you should not be having fights. And our standard of measure for that is if your daycare has two or more fights a year that require veterinary treatment or medical treatment for your staff, there's a problem that needs to be addressed. And so if you're having a fight on a monthly or weekly basis, or even once a quarter, that's too many. Really two a year is too many. We don't want to see any fights, but if you're having a lot more than two a year, then definitely look at your staff, your training, how you're training your staff and how you're screening your dogs. So I think I'll start there. Do you want to also start with staffing ratios and space requirements, Susan? Because that was a huge issue with that TikTok video. Yeah, that was, that was the thing I told Robin. It's like, we got to talk about how many dogs in space. And these standards go way back from the pioneer days, these were established in the early 2000s when I was working with professional, I can't even remember what it was, ABK, PCSA, I can't even remember what it stands for. But anyway, <laughs> Robin was on my committee and we worked with a lot of different daycare owners at the time to set up standards. So these have standards have existed for over 20 years to keep dogs safe. So square footage, space is your friend when you're putting together and having play groups and that TikTok video, those dogs did not have enough space. So in mixed size play groups, you should have 75 to 100 square feet per dog. And that would have helped tremendously. Um, and you want to keep the dogs spread out in that space. Now, if you're doing like small dogs only, you could go down to 35, 40 square foot per small dog. So that's number one. That's a very important um, benchmark. In fact, when we were still doing some on-site consulting, I was at a, in a playroom and I, the dogs were pacing and they weren't playing. And I just said, let's take half the dogs out of the room. And so we did. And as soon as we did that, the energy level changed and dogs started to play and it was much easier to manage. So sometimes the fact that you're putting too many dogs into a space is going to lead towards problems. And then the other key ratio is how many staff per dog and one to 15 is a good benchmark, but for like high energy active dogs and newer staff members, you maybe need to go down to one to 10. And that's really important because you need to have the people there to 
that the dogs see as the leaders and can keep play safe and intervene when they need to. Yeah, and I would say that the one to 15 rule, smaller is even better. So one person to fewer than 15, but even with a really, and it does depend on the size of the dogs, the energy level Susan just talked about. And it also depends on the experience of your staff. So a brand new staff member is, and we talked a little bit about this. I don't know when, oh, I guess on a webinar yesterday, <laughs> we talked a little bit about the fact that you can't expect the same from a brand new staff member as you can from someone who's been there working with the dogs for a year or two years. So a brand new experienced staff member, you might be able to watch 10, 11, 12 dogs. A brand new person, if those are large dogs, probably a brand new person, is, I would not expect them to be able to manage the same group with the same level of expertise. And I made that mistake when I first opened my daycare. I had dogs in my play group that always did fine, like seven, eight dogs. These dogs are great. They never have any problems. And the very first day I hired somebody, she was a trainer and I, and I knew her. And I said, I'm going to go to lunch because these dogs, they are great. They never do anything wrong. When I got back, there was had been a fight and none of the dogs were hurt. It was a bloody mess though, because a dog got its tail bitten and it was horrible. And the mistake I made was I didn't realize, and this is, this was actually the, the starting point of what Susan and I ended up creating with the book off leash dog play and then knowing dogs, which is our staff training program. But the mistake I made was there was a boatload of things that I was doing that I had no idea I was doing that caused those dogs to behave. So just inherently what I had learned by being in daycare, how to carry myself, how to walk through with the dogs when they were playing, how to just present myself as a leader to the dogs in a way where they were always like, oh, we're supposed to be doing this kind of stuff. And I didn't realize all that stuff I was doing and I didn't teach my new employee that. So that becomes really important. The training of your staff is super important. You can't just depend on the fact that, oh, these dogs are good. But evaluating the dogs is important as well. So we'll focus on that too, just to say you do have to have an evaluation process because not every dog wants to be in daycare. But I do agree with Susan, when the dogs are comfortable and safe is when you're going to see them playing. So if you have dogs in your facility, and this is this is a humbling and sad thing to realize is if you have dogs in your play group and you look around and you're like, Fifi never plays. She just hangs out in the corner. Probably means Fifi doesn't feel safe. Right. <laughs> That's the sad thing. This actually happened to me. Just they also dogs won't play if they don't feel safe, if they are injured, if they are hungry or nervous or anxious or in pain, like all of those things will cause a dog not to play any animal really. Just last week, my dog for a day and a half was more lethargic than usual, which frankly, I have a lab. So sometimes being tired is a good thing. Whoa, look, we're not like bouncing off the walls. And I took him for a walk and he seemed fine. Then the next day he was limping. So I ended up taking him to the vet. And for the next two days, he got put on some medicine. The next two days, he did not play at all. Did not bring me toys, did not want to go for a walk. It's the saddest thing ever. And so the day that he finished his, he was eating. So that was good. But the day he finished his dinner and he ran and brought a toy to me, I was so excited because I was like, he's not in pain anymore. He's, he has uh, something wrong with his toe right now. So that's what we're treating him for. But same thing is true of daycare. So if you're looking around your daycare and you're like, some of those dogs just hang out and they don't play, it is probably because they either they're older and don't really want to be in daycare or they don't feel safe. And that whole space issue becomes really important for dogs to feel comfortable enough to actually play. And Robin, and I think for your staff too. Yeah, and I think there's a lot more play groups out there today where dogs don't play than when you and I were operating. I yeah, I would agree with that. Transition to it's okay for dogs to be in daycare and just hang out. And I guess if that's what you want to have and the dogs are safe, then you can do that. But I think most clients and most of us, when we're creating, we're calling these play groups, we want the dogs to feel safe to play. Yeah. And that's definitely something I would look at with your team just to see, are there dogs that really aren't playing? Because I, we all have always said we want dogs who enjoy daycare, not dogs that are just tolerating it. So right. I would definitely be looking at that. And that goes into space. It goes into what dogs they're playing with and how comfortable they are in the room. So one of the things in terms of separating dogs or putting them in play groups, I, well, I guess I guess there's two things we can talk about initially. One is just size of the dogs. And the second is play style. 
So I'll kick it off with size of the dogs. And we always recommend separating large and small dogs, no matter what. And that is a safety issue. So if you have a large and small dog that you live with at home and you don't separate them, yeah, Susan has that. I'm not necessarily going to be like, oh, they should never play together. Because for the most part, dogs who live in homes do figure out how to play with each other. But at the same time, I kept my brother's cat for 10 day, five days or whatever. Ranger does fine with cats. Whenever I left, I still separated them. I usually put the cat in his little catio because I just didn't want to risk the cat and the dog being out when I was not there. And it was a kitten. The kitten was not going to hurt Ranger and Ranger wasn't going to hurt the kitten. But I just erred on the side of safety to say that, first of all, it wasn't my cat. So <laughs> I didn't want to have anything happen to my cat, to my brother's cat. But also, I just didn't know. And that's the, we would say, if people are paying you to take care of their pets, you should err on the side of safety. So big and little dogs, there are accidents that can happen even when little dogs get along really well with big dogs or big dogs get along really well with little dogs. If an owner wants to take that risk at their house, that's fine. You should not be taking that risk with paying clients. So we would always say separate big and little dogs because of the injuries that can happen totally by accident, not because a dog is necessarily aggressive or anything like that, but big dogs can step on little dogs. Little dogs can get caught in the midst of a big dogs running and get knocked over just things like that can happen so we always err on the side of what's the safest thing for a pet a professional pet care business to do and i will say that does we always get the question of the dog that's what about the jack russell <laughs> that's always the example we get what about the jack russell they can't play with those little dogs so yes you are going to have to make some exceptions from time to time what I would be saying, though, is understand that when you make any kind of exception, you are taking on some risk and you just need to be aware of that. If you have the ability to separate by size and by play style, by energy level, that's even better. So we'll talk a little bit about play style, too. But do you have anything else you want to add to that, Susan? Or you can go into play styles? Yeah, we'll start going into play styles. We in our book, like Robin talked about, the, the um, Safe off -leash Dog Play, a Complete Guide to Safety and Fun. Um, we talk about four different play styles and it's real important, especially in the chase play style that you have a dog that wants to be chased and a dog that likes to chase other dogs. And as your staff get better at managing dogs and understanding um, how dogs like to play, this is when you can set up better play groups. You also have a cat-like play that's more the little dogs where it's a lot of spinning and maybe paws on the ground. And then you have your wrestling. That's probably the scary, the neck biting and wrestling play style. And then I'm blanking out on the fourth one. Wait for it. This is a test, Robin. <laughs> <laughs> what is no cat like play, neck biting, rest or um chasing. What is the other one? The body slamming. No, what body slamming? Body slamming, that's it. Yeah, so you body, talk slamming. About body slamming. Then. So, body slamming that's what you usually see with the larger sporting breeds like pointers or labs, a lot of time boxers. They're very physical, so they actually will slam into each other. And it's really not that one play style is better than the other. All the play styles are fine. Like it's all, a lot of them are very breed specific for certain breeds play certain ways. What's most important for your team to understand is that play styles have to match. So the lab who might do body slamming, if you put that dog in with a poodle, a toy poodle, who really just likes to play, do that cat-like play and gently paw, the, the lab is going to have fun. The lab will not care that he's body slamming the poodle all over the place. The lab will be having fun. The poodle will not be having fun. The poodle probably won't like that kind of physical play style. So you, it's not that one play style is better than the other. It's that you have to match the appropriate play styles with the appropriate dogs. And, and usually dogs have one or two. The dogs that are best in daycare, like the ones that you will end up loving are the ones that can modify their play style to whatever dog they're with. Those are amazing, like chameleon dogs, where they'll really adapt their play to whatever dog they're playing with. But most dogs don't do that. Most dogs just have one or two play styles that they stick with, and you just need to make sure that they're put with other dogs that have a similar play style. And that's really important to matching and having good play groups. If you don't do that, what will happen is, that poodles, that lab is going to go body slam the little poodle and the poodle is going to end up 
showing some kind of aggressive display to tell that lab to knock it off. And now you're trying to intervene between those two to do those two animals and you might get the situation where the dog gets bitten or injured or whatever and you could have just resolved that by not having the right right by having the right dogs in the right mix to begin with all right a couple of questions real quick so katie said how do you deal with dogs that constantly that need constant redirection from staff from humping or digging do you want to start with that one susan i'll start with that one um if you tried multiple things and you're redirecting i might put them on a leash and do what we call a slip lead and do what we call a happy walk around and then let them go and if they go right back to it put them on another if you can use timeouts where your timing is good and actually try to help them understand that doing that behavior is what gets them into a timeout you might be able to curb it if you do all that and they still do it and the dogs that are being humped are not happy about it or if the digging makes things dangerous i would just reassess whether that dog should be in the group you may move them to a different play group and see if those behaviors stop and if not then that dog may need to go to enrichment or some other type of service that you offer in your business yeah and i would agree with that i we find that most of the dogs that are constantly um, humping other dogs. If it's just one dog and all the dogs are humping, that dog that's being humped, I would have that owner request a urinalysis to make sure that dog doesn't have a UTI. But if it's a dog that's humping like whatever dog's available, <laughs> we will usually find that moving that dog into a new group, he'll just find new people to hump. So that dog just might not be a good candidate for off-leash play in a larger group setting. And so Definitely look at that. I guess an expression of that his anxiety and being uncomfortable is that I've got to do something with this energy. So my fallback is humping. And that's what he's. Yeah. And a, and a lot of times people do think that humping is dominance. Most of the time that we see it, it is not. Most of the time it is insecurity or nervousness or anxiety, or it's just a dog going, I don't really know what else to do. I just, I'll just do this a lot of times has nothing to do with dominance, but definitely I would try some of those things. But if it just seems like that dog can't, can't settle down and find appropriate playmates and play appropriately, then it might be a dog that's better suited in another um, environment like enrichment, which we'll talk about in a second. Someone else said, how do you handle demand barkers? It's a lot of that is very similar. First, I would fight, try to figure out why the dog is barking. If it truly is demand barking, so they're wanting attention, then finding out who is providing that attention is going to help. If they're barking at other dogs to play, then I would probably try to redirect them. And we do, we talked a couple of weeks ago about some of the obedience cues that we recommend all of your staff use. So recall commands is one of them. And for a demand barker who's barking at other dogs, I would be recalling that dog away to try to redirect them to do something else. If they're demand barking from people, then you need to help your staff understand how they might be rewarding that. But again, if it's a chronic thing that you can't get the dog to redirect or you can't get the dog to stop or they're barking from anxiety or something like that, then it's another dog to say, maybe this isn't the best environment for the dog. Let's see. So Katie said, how long should timeout? Yeah, timeouts generally, if you're using a timeout as a training tool where you're actually trying to train the dog that when they let's just use the example of barking. If they bark, they go into a crate. That timeout should be relatively short, like 10 to 15 seconds. The timing of that type of a timeout is also critical. Normally, and this is sometimes hard to do in a daycare, which is why I'm bringing it up. Normally, for instance, if you're going to give a dog a timeout for barking, you would, the dog would be barking. I would mark the bark, <laughs> that rhymes, with some kind of word. Usually I use the word enough. So I'll say enough. And if the dog barks after I've said enough, they immediately go in a crate for 10 to 15 seconds and then you let them back out. And then you have to repeat that cycle, which is something that trainers, we often recommend doing those types of timeouts for training. They're really hard to do in a daycare when you're monitoring a whole lot of other dogs. You almost need to have somebody just in charge of that one dog that you're going to do timeouts with. The other way we have used timeouts are more like rest periods where if you just have a dog that you just think needs a break, we would put them in an enclosure or a crate or whatever. Those can be a longer period of time because you're not really using those for training. You're using those as a rest period. So just to clarify the difference between the two of those. There was something I was going to say, and I can't remember what it was. So 
It'll come back to you. Okay. So let me just look at our list real quick to make sure we stay on time. I know there's some other questions I'm going to get back to in a second, but so yeah, place, figuring out your play groups, doing separating by size, number one, separating by play styles is number two. And then making sure that you are staffing properly to make, and the staffing, when we talked about that earlier, that was what I was going to say, that staffing has to be physically with the dog. So any staffing that you're doing where Susan gave that ratio of one person to 10 to 15 dogs at the most, those, that person needs to be physically with the dogs in the room or outside, wherever the dogs are. We have seen daycares that one person will stand in a play yard and watch multiple yards. We would not recommend that. You have to physically be with the dogs where you're moving in and around where the dogs are actually at. We also don't like just supervising through a camera because you're not going to be there soon enough to affect any kind of change in the group. And you're not going to be there to intervene early enough if there is a problem. So I would say that as well. So and that's then Oh, do you want to talk about, I was going to talk about daycare versus enrichment. Okay, somebody... before we do that, I want to talk about energy levels or arousal. Because this was a big mistake I made with my team members, not really focusing on that and explaining it. Because what I found was that they began to intervene anytime the dog started to play, whether it was an appropriate level of arousal or energy or not, which is frustrating. So if you're really wanting to have play groups where dogs play, you can do that safely. But what you have to monitor is that arousal level and energy level of the dogs and keep it at a, a safe level that is play and not something else. And I think it can be hard to describe, but when you feel it, you know what it is. Normal play energy does not give you goosebumps or feel like you stiffen up, I think, as energy levels go up as a handler. And if you feel like you're doing that all the time, what we need to do is get the dogs to calm down <laughs> and not be as active to bring those energy levels down. And that may be where some dogs need the rest periods you talked about, Robin. Yeah. And that we talk a lot about the fact that arousal is linked to aggression. Yeah. So that high energy in dogs, and sometimes it can just be play. Sometimes it is a dog who's truly wanting to play, but they just get amped up and arousal chemistry wise from the dog's point of view is similar to aggression. So the example I always use is a ho is hockey games. So it happens in other sports, but it just seems to happen more often in hockey. People can realize, re resonate with it in hockey where you'll have hockey people watching the hockey game. What are they called? Anyway, the audience are, what is your that fans, called? Your fans. fans. That's it. The fans watching the hockey game get really excited and there's cheering and yelling and next thing a fight breaks out. What that's fans? The Arousal is linked to aggression. So same thing with dogs. So you don't want that arousal to get too high. But on the other hand, you don't want to intervene every tiny little thing that happens. So there is that balance that your staff has. To we had earlier, James had said enrichment daycare really helps with these issues when we were talking about staffing and space issues. And to it totally does. So enrichment daycare, if you haven't moved to that type of format, what we um, have called daycare 2.0 is a much more structured daycare environment. So smaller groups normally, higher staffing levels. So usually we're looking at staffing of one person to every six to eight dogs in an enrichment type of environment. And then there's usually a lot more structured play. The advantage with enrichment is you do have a lot more space and you do have activities that you can do where the dogs might get revved up, but because there's fewer dogs, it's not as risky. So some of those things that we would say don't do with a big group of dogs playing fetch or tossing balls around or running with the dogs, we would never really recommend those in a really large group. In smaller groups, you can actually do activities and the dogs don't get as revved up because they're smaller groups. And then it's a lot more focused and structured in terms of doing activities with your dogs. So you're not just having them play. You are going to have an element of enrichment that is just off-leash play, like traditional daycare. But you're probably going to also have a lot of individual or group activities where they're being guided by the leader that's in there. So enrichment, typically we do charge, recommend charging more for that. So you have fewer dogs, but you're actually going to make more money per dogs. And the staff ends up really enjoying it because they get to do more with the dogs. The dogs end up having more fun, the client's happier, and your business is making more money. So lots of reasons for that. We do have some YouTube videos about doing daycare 2.0 or enrichment 
on our YouTube channel. So, and I think enrichment is often a great solution for some of these dogs that you guys have posted questions about that have problem behaviors in group because a lot of those dogs need maybe a mental challenge more than physical than is which is mostly what happens in play groups and so when you set up an enrichment day where dogs are really using their brains and sometimes it's those smart breed that can be troublemakers in traditional play groups they do really well in enrichment not only is it a smaller number of dogs in group sometimes but having some of the individual mentally challenging activities that is part of an enrichment program can help those because i saw somebody who was asking about herders that just want to herd dogs i would move them into enrichment they need mental work because a strong herding dog that's what they're doing is herding that's the natural instinct and that's hard to break in group play <coughs> to enrich yeah them. Yeah, that was Jennifer who asked about the herding dogs. I was going to say the same thing. I had an all indoor facility at one point and I herding dogs did not do well in my facility. I actually referred them down the street to a place that had an outdoor area, which I didn't have at the time because those herding breeds, they really do need a job. I did have one herder though. Um, her name was Cuddles. I loved Cuddles and I loved her mom too. They were great. But Cuddles used to take the tennis ball and just play fetch with herself. So she would take the tennis ball, run up to the playground slide, drop the ball down, chase the ball. Like dogs could be doing anything around her. And she was like this bomb proof. I'm just focused on retrieving this ball, which I'm gonna run back up to the slide and drop it down again. She was awesome. But that was her own game. She created that herself, but it just goes to show you like they need a game, they need an activity to do. So if you can't provide that for them, and um, those dogs are great in enrichment. And we do find a lot of people who converted to enrichment, who in the past had dismissed some dogs that weren't suitable in their play groups, actually brought a lot of those dogs back because a lot of those dogs do well in enrichment. We had a couple questions I'm gonna get to. Liz had asked, how do you handle dogs in daycare that react if you correct them? We have two dogs in particular that will snap or growl at the handler when corrected. We do a physical correction to the flank. So our basic policy would be not to do corrections. We do everything based on cues. So we teach for experienced handlers, we teach them to use obedience cues, recall, a group sit and body blocking for, especially for gate boundary stuff. So for a dog that you might need to correct, we would probably be saying do a recall, or you can do body blocking or splitting or redirecting. Those are most common tools that we use for experienced handlers, as opposed to doing a correction. There's a couple reasons for the corrections. One is that you have the situation which you just described, which is the dog is actually practicing a behavior that I do not want that dog to practice in my facility. And if they learn it in your facility, they're likely to do it in other locations as well. So I don't want that dog to um, learn that they can snap and growl and then do that with their owners at home. They might do it with their owners at home already, but <laughs> I don't want to I don't want to let them practice that in my facility. But then I also just don't really like physical manipulation of dogs or any physical corrections of dogs, just because most of your staff, that's only gonna work if your staff can intimidate the dog. If your dog is not intimidated when you do that, you're gonna get exactly what you're getting, which means now in order to make that work, you're, you're gonna have to tell your staff, you're not doing it hard enough or strong enough or aggressive enough, and now you just are escalating the conflict between you and the dog. And it's just not a good scenario for your team to see because you are invariably going to have a team member that gets bitten yes, and another team member that can just look at the dog and the dog will be like, but the, if you set up your training that way, you will most surely end up with staff being bitten because there's going to be staff members that can't do it effectively. I would just stop doing that. That would be my suggestion. Let me see. Okay. We had, Carmela had asked about taking unneutered males and what age you would recommend taking them or not taking them. Do you want to talk about that, Susan? Yeah, I wouldn't base it on age. I would base it on behavior. So we go back to, you should have for your play groups, a list of behaviors that are appropriate to see and a list of behaviors that are inappropriate. And I would take unneutered dogs in play group as long as the behaviors of that dog and the other dogs around him stayed appropriate. If now what your highest risk is the unneutered dog will be fine. It'll be the dogs around him that would have inappropriate behaviors. And so then they may have to be 
to be dismissed for that. When Robin and I started, I would say <laughs> we all went on at six months of age. Everybody had to be spayed or neutered, but we've learned a lot about dogs and their physical development and even emotional development. And most recommend, uh, veterinarians are recommending that dogs be neutered later. And I don't think we should be stepping into the middle of that because daycare is not a necessity for a dog to have a happy, healthy life. And so I don't want to get in the middle of that. And so I would base everything on behavior. Yeah. And that's, a, I think, especially when Susan and I had our daycare, everybody was in agreement, veterinarians, trainers, daycare providers, pet facilities. Like we were all like new to your dog at six months. Everybody yeah. agreed with that. Everybody's not agree with that anymore. And it, it's, as Susan said, it's the vet, the veterinarians are actually leading the charge on this because there have been so many studies now showing that neutering later is better for the dogs, you're going to get a lot more pushback where we didn't have that pushback when we opened our facility. It was pretty much common knowledge that people were going to get their dog neutered at six months. I have Rangers. I don't know how many dogs I've had prior to Ranger. Ranger's the first dog I've ever had that's not neutered. He's five years an intact male. He's the most docile dog ever. So if you want a, a testament for neutering, doesn't intact males aren't always aggressive. He's like your perfect example. I could put you hated <laughs> Yeah, but, but that's the thing is n other dogs will sometimes take offense to the neutered dogs because a neutered, an, an intact dog, an intact dog just smells different to other dogs. So what often happens when I take Ranger to groups of dogs is there's always this moment where he walks in and he's high and he is every single body language sign he is giving off is like goofy, playful, stupid, like high play bowing, like all loose body language. And yet dogs will come up to him as if he has just punched them in the face. Dogs will walk up and be like, what do you think? They're all puffed up and, and their tails up just because he smells different. So there's always this moment when I introduce him to any new dog where I'm like, I don't know if this is going to go. The only thing I know about Ranger is he won't fight back. So typically if a dog shows any kind of aggressive display towards him, he'll just be goofier. And a lot of times that will diffuse the dog and then they, they play. Archie did hate him. Susan's dog hated him. And I yeah. think it's just because he smelled different, yeah. but it's just all about behavior. It's all about what are the dogs showing, just like you would evaluate any dog. It's all based on behavior, not breed or age or sex or intact or not or whatever. Obviously for females, I would not take females in heat. Right. And that's just because I don't want the responsibility of having a dog get pregnant at my facility. But most the challenge with that is you do have to train your staff to look for what a dog looks like coming into heat because they're typically in heat a little bit earlier than when most owners recognize that they're in heat. And so you have to look for the physical signs in the dog. So that's probably the bigger challenge for most people, but that has nothing to do with behavior. It has more to do with pregnancy of dogs. All right. See, we're already at 137. I, I, whole, like, I could have predicted this one would go long because <laughs> there's too many soapbox issues that we forget we have until we start talking about them. that is true so tracy was asking where are the videos i think you were talking about um the enrichment videos if you go to our youtube channel there's a playlist there's a bunch of playlists on there i think one of them is something of additional revenue streams so it's probably in there there may be a playlist on daycare 2.0 but i think i ended up merging them all under additional revenue streams but there are some playlists on there that talk about enrichment and daycare 2.0. And then we had a question about how long are enrichment sessions per group. So that really depends on the daycare. What we tell people to start with is generally do about four different activities and rotate the dogs every 20 minutes to an hour. And then there's usually some nap time, a nap time break in there as well. So it depends on the activity. If you're doing something like off-leash play, that play group might go for an hour and a half. If you have just a regular off-leash play group, it might go for 45 minutes. If you're doing something like an individual activity with one dog, let's say you're going to pull a dog out and do some nose work with them, or maybe you're going to do some trick training, those sessions are going to be shorter. They're probably going to be like 20 minutes at the most where you might take one dog for 20 minutes and the other dogs in the group are in an enclosure with a puzzle toy or something like that. And then you rotate the dogs through. And then if you're doing more of a group activity, like you're doing group sits, or maybe you're doing a group game, that might be a little bit longer. So that might be 30 minutes or 35 minutes. So it's not the easiest <laughs> 
question. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, but go yeah. ahead. It's what I love about enrichment is you can create the day and schedule that works for you and your business, but it's also the hardest thing about implementing enrichment is figuring that out. And we do have a program, we have a couple of resources on our store that can help if you're really interested in um, adding enrichment to your daycare. We have a PDF, Dog Daycare Done Right, and then we have a Daycare 2.0 Toolkit which the toolkit is awesome because it has videos, it has an implementation guide and can just help you plan all that out. Because the schedule is the challenging part. The toolkit has a sample schedule. It even talks about how to set up your space because it's a little different because you don't need as many big spaces and there's marketing tools. And so if you're serious about enrichment, check out our toolkit. Yeah, and that's, that's the most comprehensive implementation program that we have for enrichment is that daycare 2.0 toolkit. So I put a link in there to our enrichment resources that are in our store. So hopefully that helps. All right. I think I answered all of the questions. I'm just looking really quick. So if you, we do love this topic. We love talking about dog behavior. It's really where me and Susan started with knowing dog, actually, even before that with off leash dog play, which is the book that we wrote that then people demanded us to do a <laughs> videos a video and training program which is how knowing dogs got created in the first place but it is where we got started because we strongly believe that the best daycares out there which are the ones we want to see succeed are making sure that the dogs are staying safe and things like the tiktok video that was running rampant not too long ago showing that fight are not common and they just re-energized me on the mission to make sure people understand how to run a safe day, a safe daycare. When I saw so many people commenting on that video to say, oh yeah, dogs will be dogs. This is going to happen. It is not supposed to be happening. And a well-run daycare, if you're training your staff, you're evaluating the dogs, and then you're doing a good job of putting the right dogs with the other right dogs to play in your play groups, you're not going to have those problems. And it should be fun for the staff and for the dogs as well. So definitely look at those staffing ratios we talked about, look at the space ratios we talked about, look at the um, size of your dogs and separate by size, separate by the energy level and play style of the dogs as well. 